welcome you all to our first digital Dakota County Speaker Series event. This is very exciting and I'm glad you are all here, whether you're watching us live or whether you are catching the recording of it after the fact. Um, we're gonna talk a lot tonight about many pieces, but the primary focus is that we have uh, Senator Matt Klein joining us to talk about uh, COVID and the health concerns around that and, and speak from his experience as a healthcare provider. So um, a very pertinent and important topic to discuss today. Before we get to Senator Klein though, um, my name is Brittany Jamison. If you haven't had a chance to meet me yet at a Dakota County event, I'm the Director of Minnesota Engagement for um, the Alumni Association. Um, and that means I get to work with a lot of lovely geographic networks across the state of Minnesota, including um, the lovely network based out of Dakota County. Uh, and so it's lovely to meet you all even virtually if we haven't met before. Uh, before we get dove, dove, sorry, before we dive too deeply into today's presentation, I wanna take a moment to recognize our members. Um, in times like these, our Alumni Association members make programs like this possible and free of charge for you all. Um, they support all of the amazing resources and technology. So if you are a member or if you're interested in becoming a member, you can visit us at uh, umnalumni.org. And um, I wanted to give a brief shout out. If you don't know, and if this is your first uh, digital webinar with the Alumni Association, we offer a wide variety of webinars on a lot of topics. But most excitingly, the Dakota County series, speaker series is going to be uh, digital all of this year. And we have our next one coming up on October 29th. Joy Thomas, who's the Associate Athletics Director for Health and Performance, will be sharing all about using technology and performance to keep Gopher student athletes safe. And it's really fascinating. So I would highly recommend you sign up for that. From a few technical pieces. Uh, first, I see a question in the chat asking how we will access the recording after tonight. So I'm gonna send an email out to everyone that registered for the event and everyone that attended, and it will have a YouTube link to that recording. It will also have a copy of the slides that Senator Klein um, and Paul Ports, our, director, our president of the chapter, will be, will be sharing this evening. So you can refer back to any of those things at that time. And speaking of the Q&A, you might see along the bottom, there's a little box. Uh, you're seeing a picture of on your screen right now labeled Q&A. That is a great place to pop any questions throughout the presentation um, in that box. It will hold them. I'll see all of them and then I'll relay them to Senator Klein once we're at the question and answer portion of the evening. If you also have a tech question or anything like that, or more of like a broad statement or response that you'd like to make known to the rest of the group, that's a great place to put that is in the chat box next door. Um, if you're having trouble with audio or you'd like to listen on the phone, there's instructions on the screen right now of how to dial in. And if you're having any trouble with that and you need help, feel free to drop me a message in chat for that as well. And last but not least, if you'd like to see the, the faces of our panelists a little bit bigger, along the right-hand side of your screen, there's a panel that has all of our pictures. You can just drag the icon. There's, three, there's a little icon in the corner. You can drag that to be a little bit bigger so you can see the pictures of the panelists bigger. It will make the slides a little bit smaller though, so just keep that in mind. And uh, before I introduce the man of the hour, I wanted to give a brief little shout out to our own Paul Ports. Um, Paul has been involved since 2003 with the Dakota County chapter. He's the current president and he is being honored with the Advocate of the Year Award for the Alumni Association. Um, if you don't know the alumni or the Dakota County chapter was founded with a rich legacy of legislative advocacy and advocating for the university um, at the state level. And Paul has really carried on that mantle just beautifully. So we were all so proud of him. And if you'd like to celebrate with Paul, you can join us at the uh, Alumni Awards Affair live stream event. It's gonna be in a couple weeks on a Thursday night. There's information on the screen as to how you can join. No registration is required. We'd love to have you all come alongside, celebrate Paul, but also hear about all of our incredibly distinguished alumni who are being honored this year. And with that in mind, it is my deep pleasure to introduce Paul. Uh, Paul is joining us tonight to talk a little bit about what Dakota County has been doing. Paul's a Carlson grad. He's a founding member of the Dakota County chapter and he's helped lead the speaker series for the past 
15 years. We learned that this evening. So this all started in 2006. And um, we're very, very excited that he's going to be here tonight sharing some of the wider variety of events that Dakota County offers and, and giving you a little bit more information about the chapter itself. So take it away when you're ready, Paul. Okay. I will share screen here. Perfect. There we go. I think we are a go. Okay, very good. Thank you, Brittany, for all your comments. And uh, I am Paul Ports. And normally we do this up at uh, Mendota Heights City Hall. But because of the COVID, we're doing it as a Zoom webinar. Thank you for joining us. I will apologize right away because uh, normally we get done, we have cookies and coffee, but we can't do that. So we'll just move on uh, uh, with that apology. Uh, I think we have a very good evening coming for us. And uh, we're just gonna talk a little bit about our chapter and what we do and, and the Alumni Association a little bit. Uh, we have a large body of alumni throughout the world. Uh, most of them are in Minnesota still, 63% of them. And, and our chapter, Dakota County chapter, covers these cities. Uh, we're considered the largest uh, chapter with 21,000 alumni living in Dakota County, which is a good size organization. And uh, this is our board, which is a real good group of uh, fun people, hardworking people that gets a lot done. This picture was taken at our annual planning meeting. Uh, and as you can see, they're friendly but they're also hardworking and they get a lot done over a year's time. And uh, that I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is briefly tell you some of the activities that we've done in the past. Uh, not all of these, just I'm gonna highlight some of them and some of our board members. Uh, the first one I wanna talk about is community service, which is organized by Michael Hudson. And uh, we do this in conjunction with the University of Minnesota Day of Service. And we pick Lebanon Hills to help out with uh, their activities there. We, we are, our chapter plus just people from the regular community uh, all get together at Lebanon Hills and we plant over 8,000 uh, flowers, grasses, trees in a single day. And we've done that for the last several years. I particularly enjoy this project because my daughter and grandkids use this park on a regular basis. So it's fun to see it just get better every year. Uh, another initiative that we have is career development. And this is last year is the first year we did this. It's organized by our Michelle Potter Bacon, also on our board. And we did it in conjunction with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association's Career Month in February, which was the first time they've done it. We had a group of people meet, I think it was in Apple Valley. Uh, they got introduced, they talked about their careers and how they might be able to help other alumni. And uh, they're, gonna, they're looking forward to doing more work with this in the future years. And I think that'll be a very constructive initiative for our chapter. Uh, as Brittany mentioned, we've always been involved with uh, advocating for the University of Minnesota. Uh, here, uh, I'm with uh, Adam Use, the director for engagement with uh, the uh, legislature and then Representative Rick Hansen. And we talked about uh, how important we try to emphasize how important the University of Minnesota is to the state of Minnesota. Um, we also go to sporting events, including football games. Uh, Sometimes we have gone to the games. Last year, Sherry Madela organized a, a football game watch at Carboni's in Rosemont, which was a fun event. Uh, we had about 40 people show up, good conversation. Uh, we did happen to lose to Iowa, but who cares, it's Iowa. Um, it was a great season. We beat Penn State. Uh, we had a great winning record, the best since 1904. And then we went to the Outback Bowl and we beat Auburn. So it was a great football season and a lot of fun. Um, we also go to hockey and basketball games, men's and women's. Uh, this is organized by Bill Man Warren, who's again, one of the original founding people for the chapter. They saw Minnesota place Ohio State in men's hockey, and that game we did win, uh, which was a, a nice, fun winter evening. We've also gone to a volleyball game as a chapter, and what I find interesting, I probably would not go to a volleyball game on my own, but because the chapter's going, okay, I'll go see what it's about. 
it was a lot of fun. The, there's constant action. Uh, the arena is really loud. And, and we beat Purdue. It was really a fun night. Another program that we are proud of is our scholarships. We've given out scholarships to the local, to the outstanding students at the local high schools in Dakota County. I get a chance to read their background and it's amazing. They're, they're the captains of their sporting teams. They're National Honor Society. They're in the band. It's amazing. And, uh, and they're going to the University of Minnesota. So uh, we're going to have some great graduates coming out and we're doing a, our small part to help them with their college career. So you can probably kind of tell that we, we that's just a highlight. We do, do a lot of things. We've got a lot of good activities going on. And we're fortunate that that has been recognized by the Alumni Association. We have one chapter of the year, two years, 2009 and 2018. And we appreciate that recognition. This lecture series was also awarded a, uh, an award, um, Program Extraordinaire, they called it, um, in 2010. And that's for all the good speakers that we've had over the years. And, and so, so I'm uh, talking about speakers. Tonight's speaker is Senator Matthew Klein. He's an MD, and I'm going to read his bio so I don't, uh, so I can do it justice. Uh, Senator Matthew Klein was raised in St. Paul and graduated from Highland Park High School, and then attended the University of Wisconsin Madison, graduated with a Bachelor of Science, and went on to graduate as a Doctor of Medicine from Mayo Medical School. He is a Doctor of Internal Medicine at Hennepin County Medical Center where he has an additional title of associate professor because he teaches University of Minnesota medical interns. Matt has been a Minnesota State Senator since 2017 and represents District 52, which is Dakota County. He currently serves on three finance and policy commi committees in the Minnesota State Senate. And I had one more screen to show. I don't know if we can show that or not, but which is Matt's family, which is a lovely family. Matt Klein and his wife, Kristen, have five children and reside in Mendota Heights. Matt has a record of caring and advocating for individuals from all walks of life, both as a physician and a legislator. His connection with patients and students guides his work at the legislature. Since entering the state Senate, Matt has been a prominent voice for compassionate health care that serves us all. And they, can you see that picture of his family? Can we see? Okay. And okay. Anyway, so please welcome Senator Matt Klein. Matt, it's it's yours. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you, Paul. It's a real honor. Uh, I've attended these before as a guest, and and I'm all you know inspired by the work you're doing, the speeches that you give. I'm also a little intimidated by the fact that when I went, the audience was very highly educated. Um, and so I know that you guys, uh, I had to bone up on my facts to get, get it right for this presentation. Um, Brittany, you can start my slide deck at any time. Uh, it's, uh, go ahead and advance beyond that one. Um, Paul already sort of mentioned my credentials. I'll just mention two things about them that, that weren't. Uh, first of all, my oldest daughter, who's, who was in the previous picture you saw there, uh, is currently attending uh, and finishing her bachelor's degree at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so you mentioned you had 21,000 alumni from Dakota County. You're soon about to have 21,001. Uh, and she, uh, of course, is uh, struggling finishing her secondary education uh, with COVID-19, but I, I think she's still pretty happy that she's there and is doing a great job. Um, as Paul mentioned, I was elected to the state Senate uh, in 2016 and began my term in 2017. When I ran for the state legislature, uh, there had not been a physician in the legislature for 25 years, for a quarter of a century. Uh, right now, uh, you know, started a trend, I guess. There are currently four. Uh, two of them have decided they don't want to do it any longer. Uh, so unless new physicians are elected, next time in a couple are running, uh, we'll be down to two, me and uh, Dr. Kelly Morrison, who's an uh, obstetrician gynecologist representing the Minnetonka area. Uh, and lastly, I have no financial disclosures, which means um, in doctor speak, uh, when I talk about a medicine or you see a, a, a vaccine or a practice, uh, uh, therapeutic or something in my talk. I don't have any financial investment in those products at all. Uh, next slide, please. So to begin with just the history of COVID-19, uh, and this is fairly well known in the popular culture now, uh, it was first discovered in a cluster of three patients in Wuhan, China, who had a severe 
respiratory syndrome. Uh, it seems genetically to have been a bat virus which jumped to humans, and this has happened before with uh, coronaviruses. Um, the mechanism uh, of animal virus conversion to human hosts remains mysterious. I should actually say there, it remains mysterious to me. I'm sure if we had one of our great University of Minnesota virologists here, uh, they could give a very edifying hour-long lecture on uh, you know, how these viruses attach and then insert themselves uh, into human cells, uh, how that mutation process occurs. Uh, I don't, I, I know that that happens. It has happened historically throughout history. I'm mystified myself as to why it happens at certain times uh, and in certain places and what the effects of climate change are on that and so forth. So that's beyond my ken. Uh, from those three cases uh, in, in December of 2019, uh, less than a year later, we now have 26.3 million cases worldwide and 870,000 deaths. Next slide, please. Um, so you may know that viruses, uh, I think we all know this, but just to review, they're different from bacterial infections. Viruses are very simple and tiny uh, microorganisms that are composed simply of some uh, GNA, DNA material surrounded by a protein layer, and that is surrounded by a lipid envelope. They're one hundredth the size of bacteria, and on their own, floating around in your bloodstream or anywhere else, they can't reproduce. Uh, they need to inject themselves into uh, one of the animal cells, a human cell or whatever animal they're occupying, and once inside that cell, their DNA can reproduce. It will reproduce copiously and then burst out uh, when it's done. Um, uh, they, there are currently several human coronaviruses uh, which go around in our community annually, and, and they kind of cause a syndrome similar to the cold. Uh, novel coronaviruses are those viruses that have jumped from an animal host to a human host, and they're quite a bit more worrisome. Um, they, of course, have not infected people previously, so there's no population immunity that we're aware of to them. Uh, now, there may be some cross immunity. If you've previously infected, been infected with a coronavirus that caused a cold or something, it's possible that you have some low level or different immunity to a novel coronavirus, uh, but we don't fully know that yet. And we certainly don't know that yet about COVID-19. Next slide, please. So here were the two recent ones with which we're all familiar. These uh, were sort of the predecessors of this uh, novel coronavirus, uh, SARS. Uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome, which was found in 2003, also from bats, also from China. Uh, and this one was fairly easy to contain because it didn't spread very easily between people until they were extremely ill. Uh, therefore, it was sort of easy to isolate and control patients. Once somebody was very ill, you could isolate them and they wouldn't spread it beyond themselves. Uh, the next sort of encounter we had with a novel coronavirus, oops, back, oops, uh, was in 2012 with MERS, uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, came from camels. This also was a very severe illness and was not highly infective between people. So if you think about what a successful virus is, if your uh, life is that you're a virus, how do you want to be successful? The two things you really want to be is very highly infective and very low virulence. So virulence is sort of the toxicity or, or danger to the host of the virus. So probably the perfect virus from the standpoint of the virus is a common cold. Uh, it's very highly inf infective from person to person. It causes sort of this mild, low-level illness so that people can survive and live to get another virus. Uh, and in the meantime, they're sneezing and sort of expectorating and spreading the virus. So that's an extremely successful uh, virus. Uh, these were not successful viruses from the standpoint of genetic reproduction. Uh, they cause people to become acutely ill and often die. Uh, of course, you can't spread the virus uh, if your host has died. Uh, so these um, were, were less successful. Uh, it's a useful concept in terms of balancing that infectivity. Uh, the useful concept that I think we're familiar with is this concept called R0 or R0. Uh, and that's the descriptor of uh, an infected person, how many people they will infect while they're infected. So um, if, they, if that number R0 drops below one, that means each infected person is infecting less than one additional person in their community and the disease is on its way to dying out or disappearing. Uh, if it's up higher, you know, measles, one of our most infective diseases has an R0 in the range of 17 or 18. One infected person can infect a, a tremendous number of people, highly infective organism. Uh, the R0 for COVID-19, of course, varies depending on sort of social patterns and local regulations and uh, individual compliance. 
uh, but currently in America is probably somewhere between two and three. So an infected person still infecting between two and three additional people. Next slide, please. So here's some of the worrisome things about COVID-19. Uh, it's sort of found that balance between um, the common cold, the perfect virus, and some of those less successful viruses like SARS. Uh, it is fairly effective. Uh, it is occasionally very virulent. It can cause a very severe illness, but also it can cause a low level mild illness so that it's able to sort of transport itself through a population uh, and still survive. Um, clinical presentation ranges from asymptomatic to critical. Transmission is by asymptomatic uh, transmission patients through droplets. Uh, so again, the discovery that people who had no symptoms and were completely unaware that they were ill can be communicating this disease to other people has had huge implications for sort of public health and government response to this illness. Uh, you know, you could go out to a restaurant and be sitting at a restaurant and think I'm fine here. I'm not making anybody else sick because I feel fine. Uh, when in fact, that's just not the case. Uh, this illness can spread if you're feeling 100% perfectly well. Uh, so it impacts how we decide, uh, you know, policies around universal masking uh, and opening of large communal indoor spaces and so forth. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about that clinical spectrum and how, who gets what and how many people are affected. Um, so from the biggest study we have is from the Chinese Center from for disease control and prevention. This was 45,000 infected individuals. And what they found was that 81% of the cases had mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. 14% uh, of the cases had a severe illness. Uh, and then critical illness or death occurred in 5% of people. So those numbers don't seem too daunting until you start multiplying them out by a population. Um, so if Minnesota, for example, has 5.64 million people if we were to imagine 80% of you know, an, a non-immunized population would, would uh, uh, contract the virus, that would mean that in Minnesota, we'd have 4.5 million infections. And 5% of that is 225,000 individuals uh, who would become critical or who would die. Uh, so when people talk about sort of, why don't we take a herd immunity approach to this illness? Why don't we let it play out uh, and develop sort of a, a immunity within our society? Um, usually experts in epidemiology are fairly dismissive of that approach because of these sort of huge numbers of people that would have to become very ill and die uh, to get to that herd immunity point. Uh, next slide. Well, we all know there are certain people that are much higher risk for severe illness uh, in COVID-19. Um, older people are higher risk and people will sometimes say, well, older than what? Like, am I okay if I'm under 60 and, and at higher risk if I'm over 60? No, it turns out it's just a simple continuum. If you're 30, you're at higher risk for severe illness than if you're 20. If you're 60, you're at higher risk than if you're at 50. So it goes up like a constant slope. The underlying medical conditions that we found uh, place people at increased risk are obesity, asthma, diabetes, cancer, and really any chronic illness obviously sort of the immunocompromised illnesses especially. Uh, and then I think most of us have heard that there are significant racial disparities uh, in the United States and in Minnesota uh, for people who are not only contracting COVID-19 but also becoming much more severely ill from COVID-19. And we may discover more about that uh, as we study this illness and, and learn and know about it more. Currently, it does not appear that that is any sort of genetic predisposition. Uh, by people of color to uh, COVID-19, but rather a reflection of some systemic uh, inequities that we've had in healthcare delivery for quite some time. And it's worth pausing here to just talk about uh, racial disparities in health outcomes, which was not a subject that was mentioned at all when I went to medical school in the 1990s, but is clearly uh, the elephant in the room and something that has been present since uh, the founding of America and has never really been addressed in a candid fashion. We know that uh, people of color uh, have much worse outcomes for all the standard illnesses, that childbirth outcomes for people of color are much worse than for uh, people who are white. Uh, and that's true even if you control for socioeconomic class, even if people are of the same income or live in the same neighborhood, a person who is black will have a worse outcome going to the hospital than a person who is white. So why is that? Uh, and it probably relates to a number of things. 
uh, I think when I examine uh, what systemic racism means in my own practice, I try to picture two identical patients, let's say a 45 year old white woman from Minnetonka who came in with abdominal pain and a 44 year old, 45 year old African American woman from North Minneapolis who came in with abdominal pain. And I try to imagine their course through the emergency department and through the hospital. And I think it's clear when I sort of examine um, that in my own imagination, that those people would have different experiences of sort of the validation of their symptoms, uh, what studies were ordered, uh, how quickly they were ordered, uh, what their follow-up plan was. So I think that's what systemic racism means to me. Not that uh, I'm individually a racist person, but that I operate in a structure where people have different uh, experiences um, and different outcomes on that result. There's additional things that contribute to healthcare inequities in America. Um, there's a, a historical and well-justified suspicion of medical delivery and medical health systems by people of color. Uh, dating back to most notoriously the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, you may know in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, doctors uh, opted not to treat syphilis in a large community of poor African-American men to see how syphilis would play out over 10 years and 20 years and so forth. The participants in this study were not informed that they were uh, essentially lab rats for this experiment and that when that was exposed, uh, it was a crushing blow to trust and faith by the uh, African-American community in healthcare delivery in America. Uh, and, and additionally, sort of the, the soft infrastructure of health uh, care, things like nutritional availability, access to health clinics, uh, stable housing, stable employment, uh, mental health needs. Uh, we, all, we know that all of those are uh, lower in uh, communities of color than they are uh, in white communities. And, and of course, that, that creates a significant barrier to equitable health outcomes. So. So that is all to say that the disparities that we're seeing in COVID-19 outcomes are probably a reflection of the fact that we have huge uh, racial disparities in healthcare outcomes in America that need to be addressed. Next slide, please. So in the next slide, you'll see the website where all of this uh, data is updated every day. And people like me check this pretty faithfully at breakfast with our coffee. Uh, this is how many cases uh, in Minnesota that we have currently. Currently, we've had a total of 78,966 uh, cases. This was accessed maybe three days ago, so it's slightly out of date. We've had 1,800 deaths in Minnesota. Nationally, we're at 6.2 million cases and 187,000 deaths. Uh, and you can see that uh, the bar graph along the bottom is, you know, sort of the daily uh, reporting of new cases and it's fairly flat for the last uh, month or so, despite uh, the mask mandate and other things. I guess you could say it's not increasing, which is reassuring, but it also is not uh, decreasing at this time. Next slide. The graph on the left is hospitalizations. And this, so my capacity is I'm an internal medicine hospitalist physician. I probably should have said that at the start. I work nights at Hennepin County Medical Center. I go in uh, and when people are sick and they need to be admitted from the ER, I'm the guy who goes down and gets them in the ER, takes them upstairs and writes their orders, examines them, gets them started on their hospital stay. Um, so I regularly admit people who are actively and acutely ill with COVID-19. Uh, and this hospitalization rate and ICU rate, which is the smaller blue bar, uh, is sort of the, always been the pinch point in our effective societal management of COVID-19. <clears throat> if, if we let it get out of control, as you can see it did towards the end of May, um, and we run out of ICU beds, uh, that is when very difficult decisions begin to be made about how uh, to distribute care. And you have to make harsh judgments about who can get a ventilator and who can't. And the quality of care and, and sort of the equity of care uh, goes way downhill. Um, happily, uh, we've been able to avoid that outcome. We have a very steady hospitalization and ICU rate, as you can see in the bar graph, but it is not increasing currently and it has not um, ever breached that sort of uh, ICU bed capacity limit, uh, which we worry about. And then lastly, the, the graph on the right is uh, daily deaths. Um, and uh, again, sort of staying steady over the last uh, several months. Uh, the website at the bottom is sort of where you can click. Uh, that's kind of a long link, um, but basically if you just Google uh, Minnesota Department of Health, you'll see they have a situation update for COVID-19. If you click on that, you like me can access these uh, thrilling bars every uh, morning with your coffee. Uh, next slide, please. And here's uh, how America has performed uh, in managing COVID-19 compared to other nations. 
Uh, this is daily confirmed deaths per million on a rolling seven day average. Uh, and as you can see other sort of um, modern uh, Western uh, countries similar to ours have just had extraordinarily improved outcomes. Uh, and there's uh, many reasons for that, uh, which I'll get into when we get to sort of the government policy uh, aspect of this talk. Next slide, please. So a little bit about transmission of COVID-19. Um, and uh, so the, the three sort of known ways that it could potentially be transmitted are droplet, airborne, and fomite. So fomite is what we talk about when you, when you grab that door handle and the guy before you grabbed it and he maybe had dirty hands uh, and now there's uh, his germs on your hands. And that's the reason that we're wiping everything down and you know, you're sort of not grabbing door handles with your uh, uncovered hands and so forth and washing hands frequently and so forth. We know that fomite transmission is theoretically possible. We know that the virus COVID-19 does live on solid surfaces. The duration of how long it lives there depends on the surface itself and on the local humidity and so forth. But in theory, a fomite transmission should be possible. Uh, in practice, we have not demonstrated any actual cases where someone was confirmed to have been infected through a fomite. So it remains a theoretical thing that we are covering for, but uh, is not sort of a demonstrated major co uh, cause of transmission of COVID-19. Um, and then droplet transmission, which we know is the major cause. So that means that even though the, the virus is a tiny little submicroscopic particle, the way it gets from A to B is in these much larger droplets of mucus or sputum or so forth, which are sort of expectorated from you and me when we talk loudly or sing or sneeze or cough. Uh, and the reason, that is the reason that masks, simple cloth masks are so effective. You know, a cloth mask doesn't have the filtration capacity to block these tiny viral particles, but it absolutely blocks those sort of large droplets that you expectorate in your day-to-day -day, um, communication. So when you go into a grocery store and everybody has a cloth mask on, they're really shutting down effectively droplet transmission. Uh, at first that was theoretical, now it is proven. We know that areas uh, that, are, uh, that uh, have used masks faithfully have had uh, demonstrably better uh, transmission rates and so forth. And, uh, there's the notorious case of the, the dental office where an infected uh, worker at the dental office uh, was masked and her patients were all masked and there was no transmission at all to the several patients that she saw and so forth. Airborne transmission uh, is different. Airborne transmission is what we worry about with uh, diseases like tuberculosis and so forth. And that means that if you have COVID-19 and you're in a room and you know, you're breathing in that room and then you leave, the COVID-19 is still in that room, sort of floating around in little microscopic particles through the room. Uh, and again, that's theoretically possible. We know that COVID-19 can live in the air, but again, um, in terms of actual cases, we haven't been able to demonstrate that as a mode of transmission. If that was a significant mode of transmission, again, that would have huge implications for how we react as a society. Would it really be possible to have gyms open at all? Would it be possible you know, for us to congregate in any reasonable safe fashion in schools and, and so forth, uh, restaurants? Probably not. If there's, if there's airborne transmission, then you know, absent sort of a sophisticated negative air pressure uh, filtration system in every room, it's very hard to sort of control that transmission. So in one sense, we're sort of fortunate with this virus that droplet transmission seems to be the major mode of uh, transmission because we can control for that with little things like masks. Uh, next slide. So that's, uh, to summarize, that's why we, we do all these things that we do. Um, we, we hand wash and uh, you know, social distance and masks and cover cough and we stay home when we're ill. Um, and that's, uh, that's why those uh, interventions are effective. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about treatment uh, because that's been in the news quite a bit. And unlike any other sort of medical treatment in my entire life, uh, possibly with the exception of vaccine policy, <clears throat> I've never seen a, a medical intervention become so heavily politicized, um, uh, most notoriously with hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and actually the, the definitive work on hydroxychloroquine came out of your own institution, the University of Minnesota, Dr. David Boulware, who I knew from residency, <laughs> published in August uh, of this year, a controlled study of hydroxychloroquine administered to people after they had been exposed. So known exposure, uh, they rec patients received either hydroxychloroquine or a placebo, and then he followed them up to see if they subsequently developed an infection, and if they did, was it more or less severe? Uh, and his uh, 
fairly clear cut result was that it uh, had no impact. Uh, people who received hydroxychloroquine after exposure had no improvement uh, compared with people who did not. Uh, so that uh, there are other studies, but that seems to have shut down the um, interest in hydroxychloroquine as an outpatient treatment uh, for now. Uh, we know also that the medicine um, can rarely cause uh, rhythm problems with your heart, can cause arrhythmias. Uh, so if it was administered on sort of a broad population basis, you'd have to factor in the, the you know, percentage of people who got heart arrhythmias as a substantial risk uh, compared to the benefit. And at this point, there appears there is no benefit. Uh, and we also don't use it in hospitalized patients uh, because it has not been proven effective there either. A picture on the right is me when I go into work. Um, I've been very grateful to the community of Mendota Heights. They've uh, built these um, 3D printer masks for me uh, and for my entire department actually. So those are printed on somebody's home 3D printer and they gave us the plastic uh, shields as well. Uh, and I, I wear those for every uh, patient encounter essentially and I'm really grateful that the people in Mendota Heights helped me for that. This picture is also to remind me that the next uh, three treatments that I'm gonna talk about are really only effective for people who are very severely ill and already hospitalized. So sort of the golden goose that we want in this thing is something that would work in people who are sort of mildly ill or infective in the community. Uh, and as of right now, we have no uh, treatments of that nature. Next slide. Remdesivir is a medicine that we are using. Uh, it's been approved for compassionate use in severely ill patients. It is a antiviral. Um, it may improve survival, again, in people who are sort of already in the ICU uh, and critically ill. Uh, and we use, because this is only approved for compassionate use and hasn't been entirely validated by studies, uh, uh, we obtain consent from people uh, that they're willing to, you know, participate in experimental therapies before administering this medication. Uh, next slide. Dexamethasone is a flash of good news uh, in the treatment of COVID-19. It's a corticosteroid. If you're familiar with prednisone, it's basically a variant of prednisone. It's a steroid, which means that it just cools down your immune system for a while. Uh, it's clear that part of the biggest problem with COVID-19 is not the infection so much as our own body's vigorous immune response to it. <laughs> and theoretically, it seems likely that that's why dexamethasone works. It cools off that immune response um, in individuals. Uh, on my shifts, we are regularly prescribing this to people who come into the hospital. Uh, the qualification that they need to receive it is that they are already requiring uh, oxygen therapy to keep their oxygen levels up. And if, if that's the case, we do prescribe dexamethasone. And again, it has been proven to improve those patients' survival. Uh, next slide. And then convalescent plasma, which has been in the news lately. Uh, famously, Senator Klobuchar's husband donated his plasma to um, participate in this at the Mayo. Mayo Clinic has been a leading um, uh, advocate or experimenter in this uh, realm. Uh, so this is blood from people who have sort of recovered also, excuse me, recovered already from coronavirus. You take their blood and plasma and you infuse it into acutely ill patients. The theory is that their sort of existing antibodies will fight the infection for you so that your own body doesn't need to muster such a vigorous immune response. Uh, there have been small trials that have suggested a possible benefit in hospitalized patients, um, but very large randomized controlled trials are still needed. Uh, one problem that we're having with that uh, situation is that on August 23, uh, so just a little bit ago, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization to treat COVID-19 with convalescent plasma. Um, it's felt by some that they issued that under some political pressure to try to come up with a solution uh, for this illness in a hurry. Um, so that, that means that it makes enrollment in controlled trials much more difficult. When this is approved for emergency use and you go to a patient and say, listen, can I en 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 enroll you in this study for convalescent plasma? And you'll either get it or you'll get the placebo and we need to figure out if one or the other works better. Uh, you know, there's ethical concerns with that. It's already approved, so why would you give somebody uh, the placebo? Uh, and then there's individual concerns with that. I think a person might say, why would you enroll me in the study when I can just get the medicine? So uh, the fact that sort of the uh, emergency authorization has been rushed um, has, has been a, a stumbling block for uh, thoughtful experimentation on this medication uh, and one that we can hopefully get beyond. Um, next slide. And then vaccine development. 
So uh, as you know, there's sort of a worldwide effort by numerous uh, academic institutions and pharmaceutical companies to race towards a safe and effective vaccine. The conventional wisdom seems to be that towards the end of 2020 or the beginning of 2021, we'll probably be on track for that. Um, you know, I made this slide before the most recent sort of dramatic development. Health partners had been recruiting 1,500 Minnesotans for participation in the AstraZeneca phase three trial or human trial uh, of their uh, vaccine. That trial has been paused because one patient had a very severe and negative outcome, which we don't know was caused by the vaccine. Uh, it was called transverse myelitis, which is basically when your own immune system attacks your spinal cord and people develop uh, varying degrees of paralysis. Uh, so until they can figure out if that patient is, uh, you know, if, if his paralysis was caused, his or her paralysis was caused by the vaccine, they've paused the study. Uh, no patients at health partners will be enrolled in that vaccine trial. Alina is currently seeing, seeking participation in a vaccine, vaccine trial with Janssen Pharmaceuticals. So there may be other opportunities uh, in the Minnesota area uh, coming up. Uh, next slide, please. And then once we have a vaccine and once we have sort of this herd immunity, there will still be questions that linger. Um, we, we don't know how long antibodies last once you have them. If you have a vaccine, do you need a second vaccine? Uh, and then also with previous virus experiences like influenza, we know that they seasonally mutate uh, so that your vaccine uh, this year is not effective next year. Will you need to get annually revaccinated? Is this going to be sort of a new phenomenon for our society? Those are questions that are still out there and we, we just don't have the answers yet. Uh, next slide. All right, so let's talk just a little bit about uh, my experience at the legislature. Uh, obviously, this has been a uh, once in a hundred years type event, and there have been <clears throat> dramatic government responses uh, individually in every one of the 50 states and also nationally. Uh, and I know all of us can tell a story of what our March 2020 looked like, how long it seemed, how different it was at the end of it than it was at the beginning of it. Uh, let me tell you what my experience uh, sitting in the state Senate chamber on March 1st and then on uh, April 1st was like. Um, so on March 10th of 2020, we had Disability Services Day at the Capitol, and you can see the photo right there. Hard to believe. You would never see a photo like that right now. This is a hard, huge crowd of unmasked people who are in close physical and respiratory contact. There's no uh, effort at isolation. There's uh, no masking, obviously. Uh, these were concepts uh, no one had ever heard of the term social distancing. Uh, if you had seen somebody in that hallway with a mask, uh, you would have wondered, you know, if there was something wrong with them or if they were suspicious. Um, and at that time, uh, we had three cases on that day uh, in Minnesota of coronavirus-19. Uh, three days later, uh, Governor Walls issued his executive order number one, establishing a peacetime emergency. Uh, three days after that, uh, the legislature passed $150 million in relief for hospitals and adjourned. We got out of there. Uh, and on that same day, Governor Walls closed all bars and restaurants in Minnesota. And by the end of the month, we had gone from three cases to 629 cases uh, in our state. Uh, next slide, please. So far, the governor has issued 88 executive orders. Some of them are sort of duplicative or just renewing uh, identically ones that had already been issued. Um, but these basically are uh, encompassed by regulations for bars, obviously restaurants, places of worship, and gyms. Uh, he has suspended evictions uh, so that people who are um, due for rent and so forth cannot be evicted and we don't exacerbate homelessness. Uh, you know, there's economic and sort of humanitarian reasons for that, but there's also very real public health reasons for that. Um, a homeless population is a uniquely uh, unsafe and infective population. They're more vulnerable personally to the illness and they are more likely to transmit the illness uh, to other people. So the eviction suspensions uh, is not only done for sort of the humanity of it, but also for the public health uh, policy of it. Another, of course, of the more controversial executive orders was the mask mandate. Uh, it's, uh, we will have to decide whether it uh, changed the trajectory of the illness, but it clearly changed masking behavior, uh, at least as far as my own anecdotal experience uh, and, and that that I'm hearing from other uh, individuals. Uh, and then uh, the school reopening guidelines with sort of the three tracks for school reopening um, and the county by county policies on school reopening. Of course, in the middle of all this, uh, unexpected was that we had uh, the death of George Floyd and the, the subsequent civic unrest. And so additional uh, executive orders were issued to activate the National Guard 
and to transiently establish curfews. Uh, next slide. So we continue to go into special session and I'm actually going in tomorrow for our fourth special session. That's record setting uh, in Minnesota. We've never had four special sessions. And I'll explain in the next slide why that has become necessary. But each time we argue whether or not we should renew the governor's peacetime emergency authority. Uh, so it's worth uh, going back and looking at what statute uh, establishes that authority. It's section 12 or chapter 12 of Minnesota law. <laughs> and it allows the governor to establish a peacetime emergency when there is an act of nature, a technological failure or malfunction, a terrorist incident, an industrial accident, a hazardous materials accident, or a civil disturbance endangering life and property, and local re government resources are inadequate to handle the situation. Clearly that was the case uh, on March 13th when he first issued this uh, peacetime emergency. The subject for the debate before the legislature currently is whether that remains the case. Uh, next slide, please. So here's why we keep going back every month. Uh, there's this somewhat ambivalent or ambiguous language surrounding how long that peacetime emergency authority lasts. Um, so it, in the second sentence there, it says, if the governor determines the need to extend the peacetime emergency de declaration beyond 30 days and the legislature is not sitting in session, the governor must issue a call immediately convening both houses of the legislature. So every 30 days as this peacetime authority kind of hits the clock, he calls us back into session. Uh, and, you know, both houses of uh, the legislature would have to agree to end the emergency powers. So far, they have not done so. Uh, and so his uh, peacetime emergency order uh, remains in place. Um, and again, we'll be going back in tomorrow. I assume that the Senate majority will again introduce a resolution to end the governor's emergency powers. It will pass the Senate. It will fail in the House and the emergency powers will continue for another 30 days. Uh, next slide. So, so what are some of the pros and cons of continuing these peacetime emergency powers? Obviously the cons um, are fairly evident. We, we have a um, tripartite uh, legislative body for a reason. We know that there needs to be checks and balances. We, we know that the voice of the legislature is the voice of the people. Uh, we purposely fought a war so that we didn't have solitary executive authority. So the arguments to end the peacetime emergency are to sort of reintroduce that legislative process and reintroduce the voice of the people in managing this situation. Um, the arguments against, which are convincing personally to me, uh, are that this remains a very rapidly fluctuating situation. Um, and if, for example, if that hospital chart tomorrow started going up by 10 or 20 percent every day for whatever reason and the ICU beds became extremely limited, we would have to rapidly adjust our approach to civil behavior, to the opening of gyms, to the opening of schools, um, and, and simply not within the power of the legislature to act that nimbly or that subtly based on sudden changes or developments. Uh, so I think the sort of the, the nimbleness of the executive and his access to uh, expert uh, testimony is one argument in support of continuing the emergency powers. Um, and then there are some members of the legislature who have repeatedly and quite vocally um, advocated for bad policy, bad public health policy, which sort of denies the simple reality or severity of COVID-19. Uh, they've opposed mask wearing and social distancing uh, and advocated for reopening policies of businesses and schools and so forth that are unsafe. So the risk that um, those voices would uh, take control of our state and, and um, impact the public health and, and cause severe harm to individual Minnesotans, I think uh, weighs heavily in my considerations why I continue to support the governor. Um, oh, the next slide. And that's it. I'm, I'm open for questions. I think I made it right about as I said I would on about 30 minutes. Yeah, uh, and hopefully that's perfect. Thank you so much. All right, so, uh, and like I said before, everyone, you can continue to submit questions to that Q&A box. We'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, and still get you out of here right around eight o'clock. But the first question is from Mary, and she is wondering if someone has been cancer free for five plus years, are they still considered to have an underlying medical condition? 
Well, you know, it would depend on the type of cancer and sort of how you're doing physically, but I guess as an internist, not knowing more than what you just said, I would say no. I, I, I would not consider you in a high-risk category. If you've <clears throat> sort of cured your cancer, good for you, uh, and now you've been five years disease-free, we would consider you on, on par with a, a healthy individual. Fantastic. Um, Ron is wondering what specific COVID-2 antigen are the vaccines producing immun immunoglobulin against? You know, that's a great question. I was hoping that we wouldn't get into virology. I'm not a virologist. And I don't, I will candidly tell you, Ron, I don't know the answer. Um, there are certainly smart people who do. Uh, and, uh, but I would, hate, I would hate to speculate on immunology when I just don't have that level of expertise. I will give a, a brief shout out. We've had a few uh, previous webinars with members of the School of Public Health. Um, including teams that work with Dr. Osterholm, and um, they've addressed some of these issues. Now, some of those came out um, in April and uh, kind of like late June, so some of the information might not be fully up to date, but it gives you an idea of some of the processes that's going in behind those vaccines. Um, and all of that can be found uh, on our UMA website in that uh, previously recorded webinar section. So if you're interested in learning more, that's a great place to start. We also have a COVID response page on the UMA website that we, our team is diligently working literally every day to compile the latest press releases that are coming out of all of the university institutions on any research that's happening um, from the School of Public Health, from kind of the policy spaces with Humphrey, all of those kinds of places. So that's always a great place to start too if you're looking for university specific information, because as Matt mentioned, there's been a, a number of university studies that have helped kind of shape the understanding of, of what's going on with COVID in that public health sector. Um, there is a question about the uh, number of COVID positives that are being reported and, and whether there's any difference right now in populations between um, traditionally red or blue counties in Minnesota. Um, yeah, so the, the initially it was a largely a metro or blue phenomenon and that became a bit of the political narrative at the Capitol that this is a metro problem and not a rural problem. We have always known that that was a dangerous uh, mentality to take towards COVID-19. Um, it will eventually reach rural areas as it already has and it will continue to do. Uh, and rural areas in particular are um, less equipped. You know, they don't have the hospital capacity or ICU capacity, so they're less equipped to handle even a small resurgence in COVID-19. Um, some of our early more significant sort of concentrated breakouts occurred in meatpacking plants, which were in southwest Minnesota and southern Minnesota, where they had incredibly high rates of infectivity in those counties. And, and if you look at sort of a heat map of Minnesota, you know, where it lights up, those places are just incredible hotspots. Uh, and now there's a, you may have seen, there's a case in western Minnesota where a wedding uh, has become a super spreader event. There's upwards of 70 positive cases uh, after a large wedding uh, in western Minnesota in a red county. Um, so this is a, a virus that is not going to discriminate uh, long term by red or blue counties uh, and we need to be sort of equally prepared and equally vigilant uh, um, across Minnesota about it. Okay, I'll give a, a few more moments for anybody to submit any last minute questions. Otherwise, it looks like we're gonna wrap up here right on time. Um, I do wanna take a, a moment to thank Senator Klein for, for lending his time to us today. Um, and I really appreciated having the uh, perspective of somebody who's, who's in the medical field. We have a lot of these conversations that I've heard, ones that we've posted through the UMAA have been with people that are more on the research side. So I really appreciate that additional piece of information. Um, I have a question, Brittany. Absolutely. Is it possible for us to see the audience? I've, I haven't seen all the people that are listening yet, or doesn't that you know, work? It's not possible to visually see them because of our format today, but you can see a list of everybody's names um, if you look for that, that panelist number. So mm -hmm. that, that's the format that we have set up. We do have a question from uh, Mary that just came in. What is the medical community doing to help us as a populace to determine the difference between um, flu this winter and COVID? Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, that's a great question. And that's going to be uh, the next challenge is balancing what we know will be an anticipated uh, flu uh, season with uh, continued vigilance about COVID-19. Uh, and you're right, we haven't done a lot as a medical community about sort of symptom differentiation and so forth. 
right now our, I guess our messaging, our public health messaging has mostly been around getting people in to get their flu vaccines. You know, people have abandoned hospitals and clinics altogether. My experience is, as, at Hennepin is, I'm sure, similar to some of your participants, um, that initially the halls just emptied out. People stopped coming in for stuff they probably even should have been coming in for, heart attacks and gallbladders and so forth. And routine medical care and vaccinations have taken a hit uh, for that same reason. People are afraid to come in to medical communities to get their vaccines. So what we're really trying to drive home now is um, you can get a flu vaccine safely. Uh, you should get one uh, so that you don't, you know, you, if you were to get influenza this winter and then become super infected with COVID-19, that would be much more risky and high risk. So um, please do seek out your flu vaccine. It is safe to get one and, and, and much necessary every year, but even more so this year. On a similar note, Bill is wondering when a vaccine is approved, should we get the shot? Uh, you bet. Uh, yeah, I think the I, I, I feel comfortable, even though, again, this has been politicized <laughs> shamefully, um, I feel comfortable that the pharmaceutical companies and the academic interests that are working on this vaccine have an ethical mission and a purpose that they have committed to so that they will not release something that is unsafe uh, or premature uh, and has not passed uh, legitimate uh, testing. You know, and, and as evidence of that, you can see the way AstraZeneca has shut, essentially shut down a billion dollar trial uh, uh, on a product that could re their, com their company, you know, enormous profits, but they've shut it down because of the one case um, of concern. And so I think that is testimony to the fact that the, the, co the pharmaceutical companies are taking this seriously and doing their due diligence on producing a safe vaccine. Uh, another question, uh, this time from Jody. Is there a correlation between COVID-19 reported deaths and the CARES dollars that are received? Uh, no, I don't think that was part of the formula. I, honestly, Jody, again, I would have to sort of go back to the, to the language on that CARES uh, bill, bill, but I don't think that um, local deaths factored into the equation for how funds were disbursed. Uh, we, again, um, we got hospital re, uh, relief on that uh, bill, but, and we also got some small business relief and unemployment relief, but um, the bill that is sort of languishing up at the uh, United States Congress currently is this HEROES Act, which was sort of the second wave of that uh, to continue the good work that was begun there. And, and I continue to hope that that will pass through uh, because some of the benefits of the CARES Act, as you know, are sort of already being expired. Awesome. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up there. I want to thank everybody who um, submitted questions tonight. And I'm going to turn it over to Paul for a second to just talk about uh, some more Dakota County pieces and uh, some upcoming events that we're holding. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you, Brittany. And uh, thank you, Senator Klein. Uh, I thought your presentation was informative and interesting, and uh, you were, had very knowledgeable answers to the question, so uh, I respect your expertise, sir. Upcoming, we have uh, another webinar coming, a speaker, <coughs> Joey Thomas, Senior Associate Athletic Director for Health and Performance. I think that topic could probably uh, benefit us all. Maybe we can even apply some of it, and it'll be interesting to see what she's doing with all the athletes that they have at the University of Minnesota. So uh, we will have future events coming, but uh, because it's a COVID-19 year, we haven't got them in place. We can't give you dates yet, but uh, we are looking at possibilities, activities. And when we come up with some specifics, we'll send out emails and uh, let you know about them. And if we know any, we'll, on October 29th, we'll announce them at that time. So watch your emails and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next uh, webinar. Uh, this is our first, and uh, other than the fact we have no cookies and coffee, it, I think it went very well. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Klein. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, for those of you interested in attending our next uh, Dakota County Speaker Series event, I did drop a link in the, the Zoom chat window below. This will also be included in that post-webinar email that I'll send out in the next couple of days. Um, and if at any point in time you have any questions uh, about Dakota County and uh, the work they're doing or anything at the UMA, you can always reach out 
to all of us. I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat, Senator Klein, for your time this evening. So everyone uh, clearly very much appreciated you sharing your information with us. And uh, also, look at that, right under the clock. Go ahead, Paul. I won't talk over also, you. Also, uh, we always take this chance to say uh, and to, to our listeners, if you get a chance to support the university, if you're talking, if you uh, know a, a legislator uh, or even your neighbors, just point out the fact that the state of Minnesota makes a very big contribution to the state and they deserve our support. Absolutely. All right. That's all, everybody. Have a great rest of your night. Thank you Thank for you. all taking the time to spend time with us this evening. And we hope you have a safe Bye. times in these times.